to give us more insight into Jeffrey Bava, his life, his work, and of course this estate, we have Chana Daswata, who was actually mentored by Jeffrey himself and is a trustee of the Bava Trust, which manages all of his properties. So Chana, please do tell us a little bit about how Jeffrey came to acquire this estate. Well, that's an interesting story because he had studied in Cambridge, mm -hmm. um, came back to Sri Lanka, and I think uh, by then his brother Bevis yes. had a beautiful estate called Brief on the other side of, 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 the, of the river. Uh, brief, of course, is also visitable by the public and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and Jeffrey had sort of also had in his mind, look, I need to have a sort of estate and then retire to become a country gentleman. Right. He had studied law right. and uh, he was practicing, so he needed a break. Mm -hmm. um, s and of course, having lived in Europe, he had got used to going for weekends to his friends, great country houses right. and so on. Uh, so he kept looking for some land and the story is that he went round all over and then he found this particular property, the house that's behind us, uh, already built in the 1930s. Uh, and when he found out who the owners were, mm -hmm. uh, the owners were very, very happy to sell it to him, except that there was a man who was occupying this house, which was, I think, the district revenue officer. So the story goes that Jeffrey then said, look, will you sell it? Uh, will you move out of here because, you know, the owners are willing to sell it? And and the man said, no, I can't, I don't want to move, this is a fantastic place, unless I get the, um, the other government officer's house that's by the beach. And then he went to the man and said, look, will you move? And he said, no, but I will move if I have a little house built in my wife's garden or something like that. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole story that Jeff Jeffrey tells of negotiations right. uh, of how he wanted to get this. Right. And eventually, uh, in 1947 um, or 48, early 48, um, he bought the land uh, from uh, a lady called Nella Karuna mm -hmm. uh, who was a relative of a great landowner of this area. Mm -hmm. And she uh, sold it to him. Uh, he became its proud owner in somewhere late 1947, 1948. Right. As I say, just as Sri Lanka was breaking into independence, Baba buys this property. Okay. And all he does is really to make it into a garden. It was a rubber plantation. Mm -hmm. And um, apparently the villagers were intrigued by this madman who has come and started cutting the rubber trees down uh. to expose these lovely views that we are sitting in. I mean, for instance, the one that we are looking out yes. here uh, was created by just chopping down perfectly good producing rubber trees. So they, he thought, the people thought he was crazy. People thought he was crazy. And of course, in a Sri Lankan village, a crazy man is always welcome. Yeah. Uh, certainly <laughs> it was in those days. Okay. And I think they just sort of hid in the forest and just kept giggling and laughing and, yeah. and so on. And, and of course, he had a very clear vision mm. of what he wanted. And that's what he did. I mean, he just bought this garden because his brother had one. He wanted one as well. And, and he started making the garden as, it, as we know it. And remember, that was before he became an architect. I know, right? That's the most interesting part for me when I heard that. So obviously he had a knack for making gardens. He had mm -hmm. a knack for space making. Mm -hmm. He had a knack for um, what, what it was like to live in, in an environment that was beautiful. Yeah. Uh, partly, of course, from I mean, where he grew up and partly, of course, from his uh, days in Europe. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and he had friends who had lovely gardens and um, wanted to, I mean he said, Not once recreate. I asked him was it recreate and he said no, no, it wasn't to recreate, he said, it was to capture the feeling of those places. Mm -hmm. And it is kind of like what we're doing now, having coffee under the trees, uh, you know, the leaves falling on the ground. But it's authentic. It's an authentic to Sri Lanka though, yes. so it wasn't a reproduction of an Italian garden right. or, a, or an English garden. It might look like an English garden, mm -hmm. but it was just, it's got the feeling of those gardens. Yes. And that's what he wanted. He wanted to create in, in the end, what you said, an authentic Sri Lankan garden yeah. that had the feeling and the spirit yeah. of those great gardens that he had experienced in Europe and England and so on. And I think he captured it. Like, okay. I mean, you know, almost 75 years on, yeah. and we are still sitting here at this table that he placed here 75 years ago. I mean, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. Brilliant, this is the one, I'm going to buy it, and he purchased it, but actually, there was a little well, bit there's of a, a, there's, there's a little bit more of it, because okay. in the end, the land, once he, he eventually sold it, and he checked out all the deeds, mm -hmm. he found there were something like 400 owners. Now, oh. typically in the south, right. a lot of people die in test it. Right. 
they just don't write a will. Right. So, you know, it goes to the next and the next and the next. And whoever's occupying the house ca carries on and yeah. whoever's then sort of but they there, don't do the legal they work. don't do the legal work. Right. So the whole story was that he had got Corbett Jayawadana. Corbett, of course, was the brother of uh, former President Richard uh, Jaya Jayawadana. Oh, okay. And at that time, the Bentota Beach Hotel stands in a place in a, where there was a rest house called the Bentota Rest House, which okay. had a veranda and all of that, like an old rest house. Okay. And the story is that Corbett Jayawadana took loads of like bags of money and mm -hmm. there were these hundreds of people who came and he had to give them like two cents, eight <laughs> cents, five cents, all which was a part of their... They were all part, they were all part owner. Oh. So you had to pay each of them bits and pieces and then they signed. So have, we have this incredible set of deeds right. uh, for oh. this property which are pages and pages and pages of people's signature wow. <laughs> saying that they're selling this land oh. to Jeffrey oh. Bauer. <laughs> I think Corbett then eventually became a monk. So <laughs> <laughs> well, years on, but yeah. uh, I often think that, but that may be the trigger. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so all of these are stories that I think, uh, I mean, eventually well worth recollecting in some kind of, you know, form. He, he really saw something here when he came here. Of course, he of course. I mean, it's a, it's a genius of the place. So that inside this place was something that he thought he could release. Yeah. And that's that idea of the genius of the place, right? Yeah. That, you know, you come here and you know, my God, this is waiting to happen. Yeah, the potential. And, yeah, the potential. And then, then you, and he was brilliant at identifying potential. What I read was that he purchased it uh, and he knew, I think, what he wanted to do with it, but he realized he didn't have the technical skill. Which no, no, that's the story is that he knew exactly what to do with the garden and he did it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he had then invited his cousin, Georgette, who was, is of French descent, because right. Jeffrey's mother, yeah. grandmother, right. not his mother, his grandmother on his father's side, uh, he's of Huguen was, was British of Huguenot descent. Right. Now, Huguenot is French, right? right? So that connection led to one of his cousins on his mother's, on his father's side, uh, Georgette Ablet, uh, Georgette Camille. Mm -hmm. um, she was French and married to a Frenchman. She was in her own right, you will read in Shanti Jawadana's book, mm -hmm. uh, a, a socialist, um, very important uh, a sort of socialist figure in the art world of Paris. I mean, okay. uh, she was friends with Picasso and Braque and all of those things. I met her when she was 95, okay. after Jeffrey got ill and, and, and she had written to him and she was very sad that Jeffrey hadn't written back. So I was in Paris for some work. Right. I sat and, you know, I Great. met her and yeah. it was an extraordinary experience. I mean, you're sitting in this salon in Paris with Braques and Picassos on the wall. Mm -hmm. This 96-year-old woman sort of downing j uh, whiskey after whiskey. <laughs> and we finished a bottle between us. Uh, and just reminisced about Jeffrey. She was 96. She died about three years later. Okay. And, um, and she had come here for a weekend, a holiday. And she brought the chandelier that's in the main... Um, so this, maybe you can talk about this when you film. Mm -hmm. In the main sitting room, there's, okay. a, there's a French style, Regency style, uh, French style chandelier. Mm -hmm. That was her housewarming gift. Oh, yeah. And the story is she turned up and the government wanted to tax it. And she said, but that's my hand luggage. How <laughs> can you tax my hand luggage? <laughs> Came here and then Jeffrey chatted with her and said, look, this is what I want to do and whatever. And then she said, look, you know, you're going to run out of money by just simply making a garden. Mm -hmm. You have to maintain it. And he said, well, I have money. And she said, I have much more money than you. Mm -hmm. And I know that money runs out. Mm. So you're very good at what you're doing. So why don't you go and study to be an architect mm. and do with other people's money what you like doing best? Ooh, I see. So in, in many ways, it was her who kind of said, so then he, he, he joined Edward Zudenbeck, then ran, run by the original Reed and Beg and whatever. Yeah. And he realized, yes, I mean, he just didn't know architecture. Mm. He didn't know the technicalities of it. Uh, and then at the end of that decided to move to the AA and uh, well first to Cambridge where mm -hmm. he studied engineering for about a year back to his old haunts yeah. and then to the Architectural Association School in London uh, where he studied architecture. So how long would you say it took him to uh, become uh, fully accredited? I think he was 32 okay. but he did no more than two years of architecture. Okay. Because he managed to convince the AA that he's already had an English tripos mm. uh, from Cambridge, a right. bachelor's degree and so on. And then he kind of would have talked his way. I mean, yeah. he, he could speak right. uh, persuasively. Mm -hmm. And that's really one of the skills an architect must have, yeah. persuasive skills to speak. Why do you say that an architect must have? I think, you see, 
we always tell a story, right? Yeah. And you need to believe your, you need to get your client to believe your story. Yeah. You need to share that story. You yeah. need to want that story. You need and the, them and to believe in, believe in my story. Yeah. It's a story. In the end, look, I haven't, I don't have the building with me. Mm -hmm. The building is in here. Mm -hmm. And see. Jeffrey was absolutely wonderful at being able to convince yeah. somebody with the story. And we'd, of course he believed it. He yeah. believed that this building is possible. Mm. So he was great at it. So I think he managed to persuade the AA to take him in on third year or something. Yeah. So he did third and fourth year right. and then became an architect. So Chana, how would you describe Jeffrey's impact on Sri Lanka's architectural landscape? What would you say has been his biggest impact to Sri Lanka? Well, I think in many ways, um, Jeffrey's impact on architecture is that he was able to, one, be modern, yeah. uh, because he came from that tradition. He went to the Architectural Association, studied classical modernism, as it were. That mm -hmm. was the style and the way of building right. of the time. Right. Uh, and although his early buildings were very much in that kind of modernist style, as it were, mm -hmm. I think very soon he realized that somehow, for various reasons, various reasons of skills, various reasons of availability of materials, yeah. that you needed to have a modernism that was suited to the local environment. Yes. So in many ways, because he was well versed in the history and the environment of this country, he was able to very quickly begin to adapt the modernist principles of living to create an architecture that was also Sri Lankan. Right. And that meant accepting the history of this country, accepting the environmental mm -hmm. conditions of this country, um, and incorporating that into his work. So for instance, behind me in this building that we've seen is the glass room. Yes. You can very clearly see the modernist principles of structure yes. first. So you see the concrete structure and mm -hmm. all of that first, right? Uh, so you, you begin to see that. But incorporated into that is also the history of this country, that old window that yeah. has been placed there. Looks like it's, it should be there, but it's a really old window from the 19th century, which has been taken off an old shop and incorporated into this. And suddenly you bait a patina of history. You begin yeah. to see, okay, this came from somewhere. Yeah. So in many ways, he also, I mean, he, there's, a, there's something that he said that, you know, any architecture that's on this country is Sri Lankan because if it's made of Sri Lankan materials yeah. and using Sri Lankan skills. So the moment he began to do that, mm -hmm. accepting our history and our environment yeah. into creating a building that was modern, mm -hmm. That was the beginnings of his great contribution. Right. And today, when we look at architects as, a, as, a, as the next generation architect, perhaps the younger generation yeah. architects who are after me, I don't think we think twice before putting a courtyard in the middle of our gardens yes. or putting tiles on our roofs or anything like that. And still, we consider them modern buildings. Yeah. But it first came with Jeffrey thinking this way. Yeah. And by the time he became a very, very influential architect by the 1960s and 70s and 80s, and many of his hotels began to sort of appear in all the international magazines and so on. Um, our younger oh. architects, people like me and people like after me, mm. uh, just simply yeah. began to think that way. Yeah. Well, that's our architecture. Yeah. That is Sri Lankan architecture, modern Sri Lankan architecture that uh, is somehow appropriate and that's the way we build. Yeah. So I think the current generation of architects, yes, I mean, there's a lot of architecture that begins to try and imitate what's outside. Mm -hmm. But the best of the work that's happening in Sri Lanka, often recognized by the Bhavar Awards, for instance, which mm -hmm. we have every three or four years with the trust, we begin to see this. Yes. They're, they're not even thinking mm -hmm. about it, they're thinking with it. Yes. That's the way they think. Yeah. Making Sri Lankan architecture is about accepting history, yeah. accepting the environment, yeah. accepting the skills available to us and the local materials. Yeah. And I think that lesson is particularly appropriate today. I mean, at the moment, with our crises going on in the country, yes, we have issues of materials, yes. we have issues of importation of materials. Yeah. But we shouldn't. And we shouldn't, yeah. because we already have the answers here. Yes. We should be looking at how we use local materials, how we use local available yes. skills to create, in fact, continue with our architecture, yeah. which will be more appropriate for both the economy uh, of the country and of course for us to live in. Yeah and I think uh, I'm sort of right because this is what is most suited to us and it's in our roots. 
absolutely in our roots and, and even if you look at it in, in the technicality of economics yeah. Yeah. it seems sensible it why shouldn't we use sustainable materials available on the ground mm -hmm. and in the ground and growing in the ground mm -hmm. to make our buildings absolutely and Jeffrey Bauer's greatest influence was perhaps that yeah. look at your environment look at your history yeah. and you can still be modern yeah you don't have to reject all of that yeah. and I think that's a great lesson for us to keep reminding ourselves yeah. of particularly at this point in time. I mean, it's, it's okay to definitely think forward to like extreme modernism, but your roots should be somewhat based. I, I see, see, modern is just simply uh, what is modern. Modern yeah. is not about materials. It's mm -hmm. not about uh, uh, an image. It's about life. Yeah. You know, what is the kind of space? What is the kind of structure? What is the kind of shelter that will allow you to lead a modern life? And what is a modern life is something that we need to define for ourselves. And that is key. Yeah. It's not really about what it looks like in a picture. Yeah. It's about what you live from inside. Right. And if you're a modern person, there are certain things that you require. Yeah. And the architects must be able to give you that. I mean, if you're not a modern person, you still have staff who sort of, so therefore you need to keep your curry kitchen away. Mm. And so all of that is a non-modern. Mm -hmm. So whatever the picture looks like, you live a non-modern life. Right. Right. But if you're a modern person, you cook your own food. Yes. You have to have your pantry right next to your dining room and so on. Right. Now, that's a modern life. I see. Right? So then you will change the structure of your house, change the way it's... You don't want to have too much decoration you have to clean because you have to clean your own house. Yes. So you clean up the walls so they become nice and clean and minimal right. and so on. So modernism mustn't be because it looks like something in a picture, mm. but because it is you and I your see. picture. And that's what Jeffrey told us. That's really about a life. Right. Your lifestyle. Your lifestyle. Right. In in his own personal case, I mean, of course, he had staff and so yes. on. So and that's yes. reflected. And in that's reflecting the yeah. way he's built. Absolutely. Right. So I think that's what modern being modern is. We do right. miss the point sometimes. For sure, because <laughs> I mean that just like dawned on me right now in this conversation <laughs> with you. Until now, I would have thought modern meant straight lines and you know using, in mimicking sort of what you would see abroad. Exactly, and that's that's what I think. We don't want to do. Yeah, because we have something. So we already have something fabulous here. Yeah, for sure. So we are now at the Sangala, and Chanda, I've heard lots about how the creatives of that era used to collaborate quite a bit. So would you care to share a little bit more about that space? And of course, about well, yes. I mean, uh, Jeffrey used to collaborate a lot with a group of very strong uh, group of friends that he had, Lucky like Senna Naika, Ina De Silva, Barbara Sanzoni. Uh, amongst them, mm -hmm. uh, and then also his younger architects, Ismat Rahim, Feroz Choksi, Anur Ratnavibushana, all of them really worked together to create these spaces. Yes. I mean, particularly in his works like the Bento de Beach Hotel and so on. But what's interesting is we'll have in this room, the Sandalla, which was kind of in many ways his only workspace. If mm -hmm. you look at this single plank table, mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's, it's the space in which you could just roll out a drawing. Yeah. But there's an interesting history to this because this wood is Paramara, mm -hmm. and it's designed as a table. Yes. But the person who originally used this Paramara table uh, in a weekend home project for herself uh, and for himself was Ina De Silva and Lucky, Sen Lucky Senanaika. Oh, okay. Ina and Lucky once rented a beautiful old fort in the Jaffna Lagoon called Hammond Hill. Oh, yes. Hammond Hill is now a hotel. Yes. Uh, so in the old days, the archaeological department used to lease these to people if you looked after them. Okay. So they lived in Hammond Hill until about 1970, just before the first insurrection, 1971, just the late 60s. And the furniture they made for there to, to live for a weekend mm -hmm. was this heavy stuff that was made out of Paramara. So in many ways, this table is inspired and perhaps even might have come from part of that collection but certainly was inspired by that collection. So you begin to see what they were doing, yeah. inspired Baba to do that. Right. Now, after he built a house for Ina de Silva, mm -hmm. he then worked very, very closely with her, particularly mm -hmm. in using her batiks and her art yeah. uh, in a lot of his work. And one particular project that uh, he collaborated with her very carefully, of course, was the Bento de Beach and, mm -hmm. and so on. But if you move around here, there's a table here. And if you look carefully, it's very old and weathered. Mm -hmm. If you look carefully, behind it is a batik. Oh, I see. Right? Underneath this is a batik. Now, 
tables like these with tops like these, mm -hmm. designed by Ina, were used in the Expo 1970 Sri Lanka Pavilion in Osaka at the time. Mm, so this was a collaboration with Jeffrey mm -hmm. for that particular project, the World Expo 1970. It was a very important expo because that's the point at which the metabolists of Japan and yeah. a whole lot of people in the architecture kind of fraternity came out and said there were new ways to live and so on. But the Sri Lanka pavilion was designed by Jeffrey. A beautiful cube, two cubes of glass. And the cafe had tables like this, which were done by Nina. I see. Right. And similarly, he did lots of things like that with Barbara Sanzoni. Um, and of course, other things with Lucky Sinalak as well. Yeah. Uh, and there are lots of these things dotting this garden. For instance, if you go to the, the, the gatehouse lodge, mm -hmm and you cross the bridge onto the Cinnamon Hill, mm -hmm. there's a whole painting by Lucky, which he did while he lived here from time to time. And of course, the, all the walls are full of artists' work. A lot of Lucky's works are in the, in the guest room. Mm -hmm. I don't know if whether you're staying there, but the guest room has quite a lot of art, Lucky's work. Uh, and of course, uh, a lot of the work of the other artists hang around in this, in, in, in this, in this thing. Uh, so and he collected art like, you know, like crazy. <laughs> And, uh, and and he, he was very, 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 um, very generous with having people over and, and so on. Which then, of course, led to our gift project mm. that we have, that you might see as you walk around the garden. Yes. Uh, Leeming Way's work, The, the Bells. Yeah. Uh, now, Leeming Way is, uh, is an internationally known artist, uh, and, and, and he installed that work here as a uh, tribute to Jeffrey on his 100th birthday. Yes. Um, and across here, behind us, uh, in front of us, uh, is a series of photographs by Dominique Sanzoni, mm -hmm. who's Barbara Sanzoni's son and a great photographer in his own right, mm -hmm. um, which is part of his contribution to the Baba 100 program. And he felt he needed to photograph the makers of the garden. I see. So what you, who you see here are the gardeners. I see. I mean, we often see the garden, right? And we kind of say, oh, wow, this garden is beautiful. But who keeps it that way? Yeah. And this is a tribute to the gardeners by Dominic. Dominic, of course, has photographed the garden since he was, I mean, I think 18 years old or something. Right. He's come here by Silvette as a child. Mm -hmm. But I think this is such a moving tribute Absolutely. to the people who make it. Because often we forget about the, pe the makers, right? Yes. The makers are in the background. Yeah, the but we faces. felt we wanted to bring this yeah. out. And, 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 and this is really a, a wonderful contribution that he made along with another wonderful book where he photographs the lichens that are growing and he said look I can't, I'm too old now to walk around the garden so he, I'm going to walk a little bit and he photographed the lichens and, uh, and that's a beautiful photo portfolio that we have as well. Uh, and, and Jeffrey kind of was in many ways internationally also kind of began to collect work. Uh, mm -hmm. If you look at that work there, a man, by, a man called Nanda Gopal oh. is called, uh, it's, it's Shiva on the bull on Nandi. Um, and, and it's a modern piece right. uh, by Nanda Gopal, who worked in an artist colony called Cholamandalam, just south of, uh, of, of, of uh, Chennai or Madras at the time. Mm. And of course, the wonderful way in which he combines the old and the new. Yes. And you see the whole composition here of yes. the old petagama, the modern piece of sculpture, the modern painting, and in front of it, this incredible sort of 18th century uh, Buddha statue yeah. crumbling. So I think. That is also part of his style, his yes. ability to bring the old, the new, and history together. Uh, so collaborations yeah. in many ways, collaborations with people, collaboration with periods, mm -hmm. collaborations with time. For sure. And that's really what he was about. Channa, thank you so much for that. I really appreciate your time. We got a lot of insights and I'm really glad that you're part of um, our video because I think this is going to be something that everyone's going to enjoy. So thank you so much. Pleasure. And um, we will be taking you through um, a proper full guided tour right after this, so stay tuned. Awesome.